Welcome to The Dialectic, my name is Anirud Garg, and today we will be discussing UFC 269 and breaking down what happened on this glorious night. On the main card, we saw the return of the Sugar Show, Sean O'Malley versus Raulian Paiva. Here, this fight was very interesting because when I went into this, I was rooting against Sean O'Malley. I thought eventually this hype train is going to come off, but no, he was keeping the pressure on top of Paiva and pushing forward. That ended up resulting in a massive knockout victory. It ended with about eight seconds left in the first round. The Sugar Show keeps trudging along. Now, this might change in the future as Sean O'Malley faces much more sophisticated opponents, but given the rate of pro Sean O'Malley's progression and Dana White's incessant need to coddle him, we're not going to see any real challenge, except maybe a rematch with Marlon Chita Vera, the man who broke his foot. Now, the next fight on this card, this was a banger. Kai Kara France versus Cody Garbrandt, also ending within the first round. Kai Kara France, amazing fighter, very tactical. He actually had the reach advantage over Cody Garbrandt, the much bigger opponent. And when Cody was going in and out, he was blazing those leg kicks. He ultimately didn't focus on his head movement. And once when he got caught, he got caught again and again and again. He was even asking Kai Kara France to come forward. And Kai obliged, launching shot after shot until Cody was dropped. Herb Dean had to step in and call the fight. This is a clear victory for Kai Kara France. And I'm hoping that this catapults him forward into the rankings and eventually gets him a title shot against Volkanovski or Holloway if Holloway manages to take it back. It's sad to see Cody Garbrandt go. He's an incredible fighter. But his lack of head movement has made it very difficult for him to stay on his A game. And even though he's incredibly fast and explosive, I think it's time to admit that... His time is over. Now, the next fight of the card. This one was actually one that went to the distance. Only fight that went to the distance on this card. And that was Jeff Neal versus Santiago. I'm not going to be able to say this man's name. Ponzinibbio. Santiago Ponzinibbio, the Venezuelan. Now, this fight was very interesting because I had Jeff Neal about losing to Santiago, uh, Santiago by 29-28. Now, this was actually ended up being a split decision for Jeff Neal. I don't necessarily agree with the decision. I think that round one was closely edged by Santiago. And I think round two is a clear victory for him. But Jeff Neal won round three by a greater margin than Santiago won by both combining round one and round two. So I can see why the judges made this decision. If we're going on a per round basis, clearly Santiago would have won. If we're taking the holistic view of the fight, Jeff Neal edges out in this victory. Now, on to the co-main event, the fight that had me shook. Amanda Nunes, the lioness, got submitted by Juliana Pena. I did not believe this. I could not see this. First round, it was very clear. Amanda Nunes on. She's hitting from the top. She has that pressure. She's rearranging Pena's face. And I thought, okay, that's going to continue. It's going to be a clear Nunes victory, like she's done for the past six fights. But then round two, Pena starts teeing off Nunes, hitting strike after strike, combinations. Nunes is not able to dodge. She's able to counteract with a couple of good punches. And her wrestling seems to be a little decent. But she's not doing much in this fight. And even any, and any distance that she makes is quickly capitalized by Juliana Pena, who keeps teeing off and again and again. And Nunes was definitely terribly concussed. She was rocked. And ultimately, when Pena was able to get her to the ground... She was able to do a lot of work in moving Nunez into a per turtle position and submitting her with a rear naked choke. This is a purple belt who has submitted a black belt in jiu-jitsu and one of, arguably until tonight, the strongest and most badass woman on the planet. I, I'm shook. There was one unfortunate man who bet $318,000 on Nunez, the so-called safe bet. He lost all of that. And for everyone who put their money on Pena, you had a 6.5 to 1 return rate. Congratulations to you, because you saw something none of us did. So now for the future, this is something I was discussing with my former co-host Daniel Chi. What's next? Because this is the 135 belt. Does Amanda Nunes get the rematch? Which you have to happen. This is the, the Pena was the only fight close. There's no other real contender to take that slot. Is the rematch going to happen? Or is Pena going to move up to 145 and claim that too? She beat Nunes at 135. Can she do that at 145 as well? Especially since it seems that having lighter cut might make, it might seem that having a lighter cut might make a level playing field for both of them. I just don't see what the future is. We could have a scenario where Nunes wins 
to our rematch, but then loses at 145, and then vice versa again. We could potentially have six fights between these gals and still not really know who the clear winner is. This is honestly the perfect gift for the women's division because now we have an entertaining fight and a future possibility of some sort of movement within the women's division. And we all have Pena to thank. She was the hunter who hunted the lioness, and now the sport is in a frenzy. Now on to the main card, Charles Oliveira versus Dustin Poirier, and man was this fight intense. Starting out, no holds barred, they were going after each other as fast as they could. Dustin Poirier got into the close range with that dirty boxing. Dustin Poirier was trying to get uppercuts and hooks and all those straight punches in. Charles Oliveira had those lucky elbows to the face and those knees to the liver. And those liver shots added up. Charles Oliveira was definitely focusing on Poirier's body and Poirier was definitely headhunting for Charles Oliveira. And even in the first round, it was a clear victory for Dustin Poirier. He knocked down Charles Oliveira. The first time was a slip. We can't really count that in any fairness. Maybe the judges did. Uh, who cares what the judges think? We can't count the first knockdown. But the second one, oh man, those shots teeing off. Oliveira just dropped. I thought, how is this man going to survive? And I think Poirier made a very dumb decision by letting Oliveira back to his feet. Because once when Oliveira had some time, sure, he took, absorbed more damage. And my god, the way his head moved after every single jab that connected. That's uh, CTE nightmares right there. Uh, Oliveira is just really hard to keep down. This was very reminiscent to his fight against Michael Chandler, where Michael Chandler got that lucky shot. It looked like Oliveira was down, but the moment he got back, well, he was able to capitalize momentum. The second round was intense. Charles Oliveira ended up winning the wrestling exchange, getting down, allowing Dustin Poirier to be on the top, getting into some sort of weird armbar territory that forced Dustin Poirier to roll forward onto the ground and pull guard on Charles Oliveira. Now this is a very strange sequence of events, and if I'm remembering correctly, and, and a little bit of food and tiredness might m shake a man's memory, it just didn't seem like a very strategic thing to do. And on top of that, man, that body triangle combined with that arm triangle keeping Charles Oliveira against him was a very tactically stupid move from Dustin Poirier. I never expected this from the man who was a master at dismantling Max Holloway by preventing him from ever starting a rhythm. I didn't expect this. And every time Charles Oliveira made some sort of distance and postured up just a little, come crashing down with a beautiful elbow, a beautiful hammer fist. And Dustin Poirier didn't really have an answer to that. He just kept holding. I, I'm flummoxed. I don't know why that happened. Yeah, eventually, there was enough separation and distance made that Poirier took the damage and that round ended. Round three, now this is where it was wild. Charles Oliveira once again pushes Dustin Poirier to the fence, but now he takes the back and he gets on top of Dustin Poirier and tries to go for the standing rear naked choke. This is very, very difficult to do. But every single time that Charles Oliveira goes for the attempt, Dustin Poirier fights it off. The issue is Every single time that Dustin Poirier fights off that choke, he allows Charles Oliveira to position his elbows and sink it a little bit deeper. It got deeper once, deeper twice, and finally by the third time, it was in. Poirier's face was turning purple, and it was done. He tapped. Charles Oliveira is still the UFC champion of the world. Going forward, what happens to Dustin Poirier, we don't really know. He made a bank, he made bank from this fight, and he's probably going to funnel that into his Good Fight Foundation for, uh, for charitable ventures. He's made money from this fight, applause to him. But for this division to move forward, there's only one clear contender, and that's Justin Gagey. He beat Michael Chandler, the same as Oliveira did, and now he might be the man to put Oliveira to sleep because Oliveira is taking a lot of damage. His chin is suffering a lot. It could be possible that all this residual damage has finally met to the point where Justin Gagey is the one who knocks his lights out. We don't know. But the next fight to make for the lightweight division is Justin Gagey fighting for the title shot against the reigning champ, Charles Oliveira. This has been the breakdown for UFC 269 with Anirudh Garg, host of The Dialectic. Please like, comment, and subscribe so that I can make more videos on more breakdowns, and we can talk more about politics, about MMA, about sports, and we can talk more about all these interesting topics and question the fundamental myths of modernity.